So get ready because this session is going to be awesome. It's going to be provocative. It's going to be, uh, you know, I have been uh, insisting with this keynote speaker for him to come and he was kind of hesitating, but uh, we convinced him with the, the help of Rebecca, my, my friend. Rebecca uh, um, is one of the founders of Global Voices Online, but she now uh, is the, uh, the founder of Ranking Digital Rights, uh, which is a project of New America. And uh, Rebecca is, uh, is awesome. She's a former CNN journalist who came to the, blog, uh, the blogging world and created with, with Ethan this uh, wonderful thing that is Global Voices Online that I have been involved for more than 10 years also. So, Rebecca, you can introduce our, our, our guest. Yes, go there. Yes. Yes. I'll call you. Okay. Well, first of all, I just have to thank you, Rosenthal. Oh, you're welcome. Um, Rosenthal is a very wise man. <laughs> thank you. Um, I wrote a book that unfortunately 10 people read, but, but in the, I quoted him in my book and I continue to quote him in talks, uh, uh, particularly a thing he said about our information ecosystem and how it's changed, you know, that we used to live in a world of information scarcity and all our institutions were built for that and then the rains came, we're in a rainforest and we still haven't figured it out and I'm quoting Rosenthal on that over and over <laughs> and you. over again um, because it, it, it really speaks to, um, uh, I think, where we are today. And uh, so thank you. Um, so, but I'm here to introduce Dave Weiner, uh, who is an old friend. And really, if it weren't for Dave <laughs> uh, and what he'd done before, and I, I met Dave when I got to Harvard around the time I left CNN. Um, and he was uh, uh, at the Berkman Center. He was a research fellow at the Berkman Center, and he had helped the Berkman Center set up a blogging server, and we all started blogging. Um, and uh, Dave ran these blogger, blogger cons, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and that was really what got me excited about the democratization of journalism, the democratization of speech. Uh, of public speech um, in a way that I found very exciting um, and was one of the big reasons why I decided not to go back to CNN. So I'm just thrilled and honored to be leading this conversation with Dave um, and the room. And we're not going to do it as a classic keynote speech. We're going to have a conversation and involve the whole room as much as possible. There's, I think, a couple of you who were at the old blogger cons and may be familiar with that. So those of you who've, who are familiar with that approach, feel free to jump in and lead the way. And please, right. yes. come out. <laughs> Welcome, Dave. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yep. So what should we talk about? Well, <laughs> gee. Um, so, before we get started, before I ask you a, a more serious question, I'm going to ask you an unserious question. Oh, okay. Which is that back in the day when you ran the blogger conferences, mm -hmm. blogger cons, there was always a song. Yeah, there was. So... Do you think we should do a song today? Yeah, you, you should do, do the song thing. With well, you know how we did it? Um, so, I would stand up in front of the room, and I would... This was happened at the first blogger con. And I actually didn't know I was going to do it when we started. And I just said, what, what's the song? So what's the song? What's the song? And so what's the song? What song should we sing to get started? What's a good song that would get everybody, get everybody going out of their heads? Okay. Oh, okay. Do it. it has to be a song that we all know. <laughs> that should be one well, of maybe the a lot of criteria for it. Like, happy birthday is a good one. Rock and roll? I don't know Rock that. And roll. That's not a song. That's a category. Of so yeah, I don't know. I Yellow agree. Submarine. Rock and roll music. It's like Yellow Submarine was one of the favorites. Uh -huh. um, uh, I can see clearly now, now the, the rain, rain is gone. gone. <laughs> um, well, we could put this off or we could just wait. We could come back to it. <laughs> yes. Or, yeah. Say again? 
Oh, feeling good. Yeah, I don't this, know that one. You want to leave us even in know. that one? This is what? Yellow submarine. submarine. Okay. Okay. Should we do that? So, yeah. And you should sing it out of key. Yeah. We all live in a yellow, yellow submarine. A yellow submarine. A yellow submarine. Jane. We, we all live in a yellow, yellow submarine. A yellow submarine. A yellow submarine. And the band was all whatever. Yeah, I forget. Anyway. So are you all out of your heads now? Are you all are you and all awake? If we call on you, will you be embarrassed? <laughs> because it's not like anything to be embarrassed about. Right. I'm embarrassed right now though. Yeah. Just thought I should get that out of the way. I'm embarrassed because I sing terribly. Yeah. Well I got told at one blogger con um, that I shouldn't sing because I sing out of key. And I said, You don't get it. That's yeah, the whole that's point. That's the whole point of that's blogging. The whole point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, getting to the point. Yes. What point? So, you are blogger number one. I guess, yeah. Essentially, right? <laughs> this is blogger number one. So, how, did, how the heck did that happen? Oh, it wasn't like I woke up one morning and said, I think that blogging is something I should do. It wasn't like that at all. Um, uh, I started out, I was just a programming project. I had a, a great list of contacts. Um, I've been going to tech industry conference. That's where I'm from. I'm from the tech industry. I w had started a software company in the early 1980s. And uh, um, I've been going to conferences. I had all these, I had a great Rolodex. And I wrote a script um, that would just send emails to, every, it was spam basically, but this is before spam existed. And, um, <laughs> And so I sent an email uh, announcing a, a, a press conference that a friend was going to have. And then um, I sent it to groups of 11. That was sort of the idea, just a random number. And then um, I followed it up with uh, what, you know, a report basically on what had happened there. And then I remember exactly where I was when I had this sort of, it was almost an epiphany that I could use this same little script to send out my own ideas. And so I had been, at that time, visiting with, I had um, sold my company, we had done an IPO, I was basically looking for the next thing to do. And so I had been going around to all kinds of tech companies and finding out what they were working on and then giving, writing them sort of advice, which they weren't listening to. And I just decided to take the first one of those things and just send it out to everybody. And People reacted very weird. They thought, this is weird. What's he doing? You know. So then I did another one. The first one was about uh, I wanted Apple and IBM to work together. I wanted the, IBM to sell the Mac OS. Uh, because at the time, well, I don't want to go into too much detail. Then I did one about PDAs. PDAs mm -hmm. were like the precursor to the iPhone. Um, and, uh, and then I... I got a response from a friend of mine who was the CEO of Motorola's PDA division, a guy named Randy Patat. And uh, so I sent that out to everybody. And I got back a whole bunch more responses. And what this led to was then the next epiphany <laughs> was um, that, wow, this changes how everything works. This is different. That all the world that the tech industry is envisioning isn't the world that's actually going to happen. Because if I'm just an individual and I can create this kind of effect in the world just because I had the idea that, well, things like AOL, CompuServe, uh, Microsoft had just launched a competitor to CompuServe called Marvel. And uh, so I wrote a piece called Bill Gates versus the Internet. and Because uh, Bill Gates was dominant at that point in the tech industry. And... Uh, and I said, you know, Bill Gates is betting his company on Marvel, and it's not going to work. Because look at this internet thing. It's got a manual that's that thin, and, you know, anybody can do this. And so I got a response from Bill Gates, and I ran that. And it, that made the earth shake. Everybody said, wow. I mean, like, look what just happened. And it just kept building. It, you know, it wasn't like everything we did from that point Every experiment we tried, I mean, not everyone. There were certainly some things that didn't work, and we backed off those and didn't pursue them. 
but it was a, con a continual process all the way through, I would say, the early 2000s. So this is like mm -hmm. all the way up to the point where we met in 2003 um, and beyond. I mean, it just kept growing. There are new ideas. Um, in 1999, I wrote a piece called Edit This Page. That's where we cracked the nut in terms of how to make this stuff actually easy so that normal people could, do, could, could write uh, what eventually became known as blog posts. Mm -hmm. um, but that wasn't the end. Um, so it 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 was a it was a process. It obviously was a there was an idea here. Right. And, you know that's how you sort of you're you're sort of feeling your way around. This is how technology evolution works. Is you're feeling your way around in a sort of a dark room, and you're trying to grab things here and there. And if you if you find that this thing there's something here, you just go in that direction for a while. Right. This one had a lot of room for growth, and that's why I found it so exciting, both as a technologist, and I didn't know that I was going to be a writer. That was never my assumption that I was going to do that, but out of that, I ended up getting a journalism gig. I was writing at, I wrote at Wired for two years. Mm -hmm. That was a blast. And you also collaborated with journalists in a lot of different ways, like in San Francisco during the yeah. newspaper strike. What was yeah, it, 94, that. right? That was in 94, right. Um, so after having... I don't know if this is before or after Bill Gates versus the Internet, but there was a, a newspaper strike in San Francisco in uh, the fall of 1994, and uh, I had wanted to do a project with the web. I didn't really know how that worked. And uh, I heard on the radio that there was going to be a San Francisco newspaper strike, so I called up Bruce Coons, who was at the uh, San Jose Mercury News. Um, I was living in the Bay Area at the time. And I said, I hear you guys are going on strike. Do you need some help? And he said, yeah. And so I got out my scripts, and I started writing stuff. And we wrote a little content management system for the strike paper. And uh, I was working for all kinds of incredible journalists because people all over the country were contributing, news people all over the country were contributing to the strike paper. Um, it's sort of like the guard was down. You know, there was no sort of critical, you know, normally when you knock on the door of a news organization, you say, let's work together on a project. Well, they have all kinds of reasons why they won't do it. But when they're going on strike and they need to get the strike paper out the next day, <laughs> if you offer to help them, they accept the help. And uh, what was really weird about it was the guy who taught me about how to do this stuff was a guy named Chris Gulker. And he was working uh, at the San Francisco Examiner at the time. And uh, he was working on the management newspaper on the web. And we just shared code. I mean, it was like the weirdest behind-the-scene collaboration you ever see, saw. Because I don't think either of us, I and mean, Chris is no longer with us, so he can't, he can't tell you. Uh, but um, I don't think either of us had any skin in the game in terms of the strike. The strike was, believe it or not, was about automation. Mm. We were against automation. I was doing automation mm. for the strike that was against automation. <laughs> <laughs> it was a weird, I that. but I didn't care. I just wanted the opportunity to do this, and it was great. And we, you know. Yeah, and I, one, one of the things you've written about on your blog recently um, uh, is is about the thrill when you first started blogging. Of you know, you're you're a source. Journalists would call you up, yeah. and interview you, and and then you'd get. You know, then your words would be published. But in, as as a blogger, you were a source that went directly to yeah. the public. You know, that became a slogan. Direct. Sources go direct. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and sort of from that, you know, if if I mean, I imagine you probably were thinking at the time, you know, where this would lead in twenty twenty five years. Yeah. What did you imagine? Only goodness. <laughs> that was, I mean, it was, I was very excited about the future, and I was right in some ways, and I was wrong in others. Um, one of the ways I was wrong is I thought everybody would blog. And, uh, uh, and so I would approach people as if, of course, you're going to blog, right? And, but most people don't have the impulse to do it. They just don't. Um, and uh, so I learned about this, what I ended up calling natural-born bloggers. Mm -hmm. and there are, like, you're a natural-born blogger. I am a natural-born blogger. Uh, all the people who ended up becoming, Jay is, of course, a natural-born blogger. Uh, I mean, you know who you are. I mean, there must be other people in the room who could ask for a show of hands <laughs> who thinks they're a natural-born blogger. See? 
Look at that. It's like, that's about it. I mean, it's one, two, three percent of the population. My mom was a natural born blogger. My father was not, you know. That's where I got the gene from, you know. So, um, so that was the first mis misunderstanding. Uh, Doc Searles was the first person that I encountered on my sort of Johnny Appleseed thing where I was going out trying to get everybody to plug. Yeah. Doc Searles, totally, now, I don't know how many people know Doc, but uh, he's totally a natural born blogger. Um, the other thing is I had no concept that it could be used for ill, that, yeah. that I just saw goodness in this. And, um, and I think now we're getting, you know, flat, fast forward to 2019, um, we're really only getting, or mostly getting the bad. And I think that's true because we're not collaborating. That the good that came out, that comes out of the blogosphere, which are people who, I mean, who are bloggers? Bloggers, in my opinion, and I didn't have this cle as clear then as I do now, bloggers are your sources as journalists, assuming that uh, most of the people here think of themselves as journalists, we're your sources. And there was a huge misunderstanding. Um, it goes back to uh, a long way, but at the, mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to be able to get the cartoon up there easily. Mm -hmm. So there was this incredible cartoon at the tw 2004 Democratic National Convention um, about what was the difference between a blogger and a journalist. And a journalist has all these credentials, the Pulitzer Prize, covered the White House, et cetera, et cetera. And a blogger's credentials were, I have a PC. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, everybody laughs at that one. And it wasn't funny to me. Um, because at that point in time, this was, what, 2004, I was 49 years old. Um, yeah, you had a lot of expertise. I had a lot of credentials, to be honest. I mean, I had, you know, worked my way through the tech industry and risen to the top. I had done an IPO. I had worked at Wired. I was a f research fellow at Harvard University. That's a nice credential, right? I mean, I had a, I, I, I did a lot of experience, and I was not unusual amongst the people who were bloggers at the t 2004 DNC. But that's the way journalists viewed us, uh, I think they felt threatened by us, that he, these people would like to think of themselves as replacing journalism. And, you know, to be fair, they're pro we probably did say at some points we were. I mean, I, it's quite You're possible. certainly challenging the status quo. Yeah, it's quite possible that I even said that at times, too. But with the benefit of hindsight, it wasn't true. We weren't doing that. And so, you know, my appeal today is... We should be collaborating. We should be working with each other. Um, I just want to, this isn't responsive to your question, but I've had a recent experience uh, um, with Facebook. And I think people only see one side of Facebook and miss the other side. You know, see Facebook, people see Facebook as a distribution system for journalism, a way of getting the journalism out to the people. But what I've discovered recently is Facebook is also an incredible way of organizing your sources. Um, I moved from... New York City, I was living in Manhattan, and now I live in the country, in upstate New York. And I had all the questions that people have when they move to a new area, and I was just going to ask my friends, you know, where do you go for coffee in the morning? Where's a good place to shop for groceries? What airport should I fly out of? All these. And then I discovered that there was a private Facebook group just for the community, and it was a gold mine. It was incredible. I'd ask these questions like, where do I go for hikes? I need to walk every day for exercise. Huge response from that. And it's the impulse that people have, and I think we overlook this as a resource, that people want to show off what they know and they want to help. I think that the impulse to help people is one of the things that makes humanity great. And um, they might not be bloggers, but they love being sources. And so we ought to expand our view of where we go to find our sources. Um, if there is no private Facebook, you know, I, I hate Facebook as much as, <laughs> probably more than most of you do, because they had a very negative effect on blogging. I mean, mm -hmm. they sort of usurped blogging and then didn't feed the system back. Yep. So I do hate them for that, but I'm not going to, uh, I don't know what the right way of explaining it, but it's like, I'm not going to punish myself because I hate them, you know. 
that they happen to have done something phenomenal, which is organize, I don't know, it's not 100% of the people of the world, yeah. not 100% of the people of the United States, but it might be 80%. And what an incredible milestone for humanity. <laughs> I mean, you could reach 80% of the people who live in your country, assuming you live in the U.S., and it's true elsewhere in the world, too. Why not take advantage of it? So let's talk some more about Facebook. Okay. Sure. So, you know, I, you know, you and I were talking yesterday, and, and I've kind of felt this for a while, that, um, you know, th there's a lot of indignation about, you know, what Facebook has done to journalism. Mm. But I, I tend to feel, and, and, you know, this is not my talk, so I'll let you kind of fill in most of the details and, and maybe other people in the room have views. But I tend to feel, feel that journalists do share some responsibility for Facebook having become so powerful yeah, and do. are not, not <laughs> sort of acknowledging, t taking responsibility for this responsibility, as, as it were. Yeah, where do um, I begin? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, if, if this, this is a good point for if, if anybody wants to jump in and interject and, and, and cease being passive audience and be part of the conversation, um, feel free, but but uh, uh, yeah. What specifics would you like to know about? Well, I I, I mean, you know, it, it it yeah. I mean, just just it, it seems that that I don't know. About ten years well, ago, when I started writing critically about Facebook, a lot of journalists were really surprised yeah. that I was being critical of it. Well, the criticism of Facebook should have started ten years ago easily, <laughs> absolutely. And the, and journalism was. Um, being very, we have a hand up, by the way. Let me just finish the thought, and we'll get right to you. Um, can we get that cube up to her? Yeah, up there she needs hand? a cube. Yeah, up there. There's a cube That's there. our next speaker is up there. In the yeah, corner. there's a, there's a um, hand. Let's but while we get it, yeah, it's got a long way to travel. But Let's migrate the cube. Um, we you know, there, okay. okay, time to wake up. Okay, everybody. let's, let me, okay. let me finish the thought. Yeah. Okay, we're going to do this. Okay. So now, now Dave's going to talk, and then, you're gonna and, and then she'll talk. So, so last year, I think it was last year, it was the Cambridge Analytica, was that mm -hmm. the name of the company? It was like this big, huge controversy, and the press was writing about it, like they had like discovered something, and it was terrible. And I was going, how is this a discovery? Facebook mm -hmm. announced to great fanfare in 2011 this whole idea of the open graph. And they explained very carefully what the implications of the open graph were. It meant that developers would have access to all the information that users were putting into Facebook. Now, if you heard Facebook getting, Facebook would not get up and give that press conference today, right? <laughs> but the alarms should have gone off at that point, and the questions should have come. It was like, well, what are the implications of this, you know? And um, so, you know, last year, 2018, in the aftermath of the 2016 election, they're looking for somebody to blame for what happened. And Facebook what became the scapegoat, and Cambridge Analytica was the incident. But it, it's like analogous to complaining about a leaky faucet in Manhattan when all the faucets in Manhattan are leaking, and you have a flood going down the middle of the street. Um, and people can't for live For years. There. For years the flood's been going on. That data that Cambridge Analytica had, I was a Facebook developer. I had access to all the same data. Now, I'm a g nice person. I didn't want all that data, and I didn't want to do anything you know, nefarious with it. But if I had, and there were plenty of developers, plenty of venture capital-backed developers coming from Silicon Valley, um, they don't have a whole lot of ethics or... Um, they're there to make money. <laughs> and I think people don't really have the right idea about the tech industry, which is another point. The journalism industry should have competed with Facebook. As soon as Facebook came up, Facebook presented a challenge to journalism that journalism still has not risen to. The thing that, so you ask the question, why does Facebook get all the money? Why are you all trying to get money from Facebook? Some people here probably are from Facebook. Um, yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, they fund. They are. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're fun a funder. Yeah, I, I didn't take the money. I paid my own airfare to come here because I didn't want their money. Um, and, but why didn't you compete with them? 
It's a good, isn't that a good question? Yeah. I mean, if you came from the tech industry like I did, that would have been your first impulse. It's like, oh my God, these guys are making all this money doing something somewhat like what we do. Mm -hmm. Why don't we just do what they do and make the money? Why ask them for money? You know, there's no power in asking them for the money, right? I mean, if they give you money, why are they giving you the money? Because they want you to write nice things about them. Because they want you to stop saying that they're the devil incarnate. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of <laughs> obvious, you know, it, and where are the ethics of journalism in all this? You know, a year ago, the switch flipped in journalism, and all of a sudden, Facebook went from being the cute, cuddly baby squirrel, right? I mean, we have this phrase in the tech industry called the, the baby squirrels, <laughs> and every so often, there's a company that comes along that we call the baby squirrels because everybody loves them because they're so cute and adorable and cuddly and all the rest of that. So, Mark Zuckerberg used to be like the ultimate baby squirrel while he was like stealing your industry from you. And it, you know what it was. I'll answer the question and then we'll go. Mm -hmm. the, the thing they did that you guys still won't do is they created a level playing field. They let everybody contribute to the news. They didn't have, I can write articles on Facebook and nobody stops me from doing it. Mm -hmm. There's no barrier to entry there. That's why they get the money. And if journalism wants the money, you're not gonna, you, it's not going to come with no strings attached from Facebook. It's going to come with the most odious strings imaginable. It's going to remove all of your objectivity, all of your independence. It's going to go down the drain with that. So the only way we get, and you know, I'm sorry, one more thing I have to say, is that the assumption journalism makes is that the only people who care about journalism are journalists. And that is so wrong. You know, I've only for a tiny bit of my career have done anything remotely like journalism, and I care deeply about journalism. Hello. When you guys go over my head and you go make the deal with Facebook, I go, well, we got to, we used, Jay and I used to do a podcast. We called it Rebooting the News. We've got to reboot the news. We've got to do it without you if you won't do it yourselves. Okay. Okay. Speech over. <laughs> Sorry. The Cube. Hi, Nikki Usher here. Um, thank you so much for, for coming and sharing your insights about uh, the early history that at least I was definitely not paying attention to. Uh, cause, um, so thank you so much for coming here. Um, I was wondering if it would be possible for you to reflect a little bit on the access to privilege that you had to be successful uh, in the context of the early tech, tech industry. You mentioned a level playing field on Facebook, and just because everybody can be heard does not mean that everybody can be listened to. Oh. So I was wondering if you could maybe reflect a little bit on the advantages that you've had um, to put you in the position you are today to be speaking with us. Well, sure. And I, before you answer that, you know that you know that picture we had up at the beginning. Could we put that back up? That would be great. Why do we want the picture up? Because I'm going to refer to it eventually. It's a great picture, by the way. Yeah, because it, well, it relates a little. Well, of course, I had a lot of advantages. I mean, there's no doubt. I, I understand where the question's coming from. I believe I do. Um, and uh, I come from a, a family that had a tremendous value on education. Um, my parents both had PhDs. Um, they, sorry. Yeah, I'm also the first generation. Your grandparents generation. were also, refugees, too. My parents were refugees. I'm a first generation American. So they fled for their lives. Um, in, my parents were children when they fled for their lives. Um, and uh, so, I don't know. I mean, there were a lot of disadvantages that came from that. I mean, I don't want to go into all the psychology of it, but being raised by refugees is not necessarily an advantage, okay? But on the other hand, you know, yeah, of course. I have privilege. I have my family uh, had money, but when they arrived in the United States, they didn't have any money. Um, not a, I mean, I didn't volunteer this. You asked the question, right? I guess the question so. is, if, if you have privilege, are you supposed to just be really apologetic about it and not use it, or are you supposed to use it? Well, also, yeah. what's the question? The question is just to reflect on it. Well, I think I have been reflecting on it. Right. Um, what does it mean to be a white dude living here? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, I know. Okay, great. Well, you know what? Okay, you could have this conversation, of course, with any white dude, right? Absolutely. Right, okay, good. Um, when I started blogging, 
I mean, I'm going to ask you a question, right? When I started blogging, nobody was blogging. There were no barriers to entry. Would it have made a difference that I was a woman or a person of color? Hard to imagine that it would have made a difference. I mean, yeah, probably would. Oh, okay. Well, I, I don't think. Okay. So, uh, you seem very certain about that, but I am afraid I'm not that. So, certain. so let, let's before we get too far down this this yeah. road. Um, I, I, let's, Wait a let's second. Just, why? Why me? You know how many other yeah. white dudes were up here? So, so I mean, you know, why, why, why me? Because maybe because I'm confident and because I have strong opinions. Yeah. Maybe that's what you object to. So, right? so Dave, should I just be? Should I just be quiet and yeah, be so, respectful? So Dave's and, a white dude, and he was a white dude who was able to do this thing. And I think we can have a real conversation about had he not been a white dude and had he. But I didn't keep other it for profile, myself. I developed this but, stuff so everybody could have a voice. Yeah. Now, I, maybe, you know, th there's whatever. Th there's a lot of, you know, th the privilege of people who run Facebook, for example, or run any number of tech companies is, I think, contributing to a lot of the problems, which is why I'm kind of bringing up this picture again. Um, th this is, you, you want to describe this picture? Sure. Well, why don't you? Because but, oh, I will. But, I'm sorry. But, I was going to say something snarky. I'm actually no, kind of offended by the, the no, whole let's, thread. Let's, but, let's let's um, let's let's talk. Let's. I, I'm I'm trying to shift the thread in, into somewhere that that we don't just get into an argument about white dudes because I'm I'm not interested in that argument. Not really either. Um, but describe this picture for a minute. Okay. Um, so my family was part of the desegregation of New York City in the 1960s. So that picture is the woman wearing the scarf is my mom. The little kid holding her hand is my little brother. He's 60 years old now, by the way. And um, what they're doing, I'm not sure why this is in response to this, but I'll tell the story anyway. Because we're talking about diversity. OK, yeah, fair so. enough. Oh, that's actually true. Um, so what are they doing? <laughs> we, were, we lived in a white neighborhood called Jackson Heights in Queens in New York City. And they had a court order in New York City at the time to desegregate the schools. So my school, my elementary school, was paired with a school in the adjacent black neighborhood. And half the kids in my school went to their school, and half the kids in their school went to mine. So that's my mom walking my brother to the black neighborhood. This was on the front page of the New York Times, by the way. It was an incredible picture. And as you can see, there are the black, there's a black mother walking her children to the white school. So I don't, I mean, so, you know, whatever. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I, there, there's a, a lot of conversations going on about tech and media and privilege. We have five minutes left. Oh, Jesus. oh God. Um, tech and media we have a lot and, more to cover. We... and who has a voice and all kinds of things. There's one big idea that I want to be sure we talk about. Okay, right you now. do that. Um, which is that um, when I watch journalism cover tech uh, topics, it's appalling to me how wrong they get it. So an example would be Hillary's emails during the uh, 2016 election. This was a major issue started by the New York Times. It became, I mean, it's quite possible it determined the outcome of the election. And, um, and I don't know what the issue was. I read all the articles that I could get my hands on, and I never, they never answered the question, what is the issue here? So, and then last year it was Facebook. And the question, uh, the first, in the 2016, the issue was, what is an email server? And I don't think a lot of reporters understood what an email server was. So the idea that she had an email server sounded insidious. It sounded terrible. Um, I felt this because I didn't, desperately did not want Donald Trump to be president of the United States. Um, last year, it was Facebook and their APIs. Again, I read all the articles to get my hands on. I couldn't find the issue. And so the suggestion I have for the journalism, and specifically this part of it, the academic part of it, is run some boot camps. When the issue comes up, at the moment it comes up, on the technology, 
for reporters. It's a collaboration between the journalism school and the computer science department. Or, you know, I think that's basically it. And do it in an immediate response as the news is actually happening. And, um, I mean, that's, that's it. You don't need me to do it. Anybody could do this. But it's about time that journalism took some responsibility. Okay, you all don't have computer science degrees, but you can get the story right, and you can head off these issues in advance. So I'm going to be obnoxious because we started late, so I'm going to demand an extra five minutes. Okay. Um, uh, and because it wasn't our fault that, that we started late. Um, because, yeah. Oh, I have, happen to have an answer to that yeah. question. Um, maybe we could get that one. I think, I think you wrote about this. I wrote about it, yeah. Because I know that you, you have an answer, so. I know. I'm a little bit disheartened and a little bit sort of, you know, uh, I don't know what the right word is. Um, what I would do is I would, uh, I would compete with Facebook. It was what I was saying before. Um, and it was a proposal that I made to the New York Times in 2002. I uh, had gotten leaked to me uh, the XML files that they were using to syndicate their content to other news organizations. And I, I thought it was so great that I just repurposed it as RSS and published it and got shut down. And then I ended up in a meeting with the CEO of the New York Times Digital, Martin Niesenholtz, and I proposed two ideas. One is, give me the feeds, which they did. And that, by the way, is why RSS came out of the tech industry and became a, a, a juggernaut in the journalism industry. And the other one was, give a blog to every source that you quote. And I believe if they had done that in 2002, there would not be a Facebook today. And the idea simply is to open up journalism to the people. And yeah, it's going to create some problems, I, no doubt. And you deal with the problems. Um, but there is a whole, I don't know, I mean, I wrote a whole blog post about it, in quite detailed. Um, and it would be hard to, you know, recite the whole blog post in a, in a talk here. But um, if there's any way we, I can communicate that, then I would be glad to do that. Final question, and then I'm, I'm going to have one more question. Great, great. Ha have some help in the middle. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I wanted to just ask you about the, the reboot of the news. I, I work for a, a small, entirely donor-funded investigative unit in South Africa. Um, we're quite lucky that uh, we have donors who are willing to fund us. Do you see the reboot of the news as something that will only sort of happen within the context of journalism moving to a donor-funded model? Or could you see a reboot happening within the traditional commercial model of journalism? What was the first part? You, you said, I, I didn't, there's a dichotomy there. Basically, should journalism be funded by, well, by philanthropy or is there a commercial? No, I, I just mean in, in terms of the reboot of the news. I know, I got that part. I understood about. that part. No, I'm far more radical than that, is, actually. Is there um, a commercial model? I, I actually think we ought to hedge against the, there being no commercial model for news. Um, I know this is very hard for journalism people to contemplate, but as I said earlier, there are those of us who are not in journalism that want to have journalism even if the business model for journalism fails. Um, so one of the things, so I don't accept either of those. That's not how I see news rebooting. I see, I think the things we ought to be doing now is we ought to be teaching journalism to everybody who wants to learn journalism. And, um, and, and I think that we should come to see journalism not only as a way for somebody to earn a paycheck, but also as a civic responsibility. For those of us who are, have the impulse to do it, there should be a way to do it. Um, and uh, so I think, for example, if you get a, a degree from the University of Texas, you should take a semester of journalism. Yes. Um, 
I know, this is how we connected, me and Rosenthal. <laughs> well, I mean, this is seriously a very exciting idea, and I don't know why we don't do it. Um, yeah, and, uh, and that, you know, we, everybody talks about news literacy, but I don't know a better way to learn how something works than to actually do it yourself. And then should it sort of, you know, if should journalism fail, at least we'll have some knowledge of how to recognize journalism when our society reboots it. I mean, think about a world without journalism. I mean, that's like a world without civilization. So at that point, we're going to be rebooting not just the news. We're going to be rebooting humanity. <laughs> it's, the, it's that big a question. So I think we ought to be preparing. We ought to be hedging. Thank you. Yeah. And, and also, you know... Wow, I'm surprised. So I told not. Rosenthal, I told Rosenthal, you all were going to lynch me if I no. said stuff <laughs> like this. Uh, no. He just promised me you wouldn't, so you... you uh, we're in this you together, have a leader. right? Yes. I think I mean, we one are. Of the, one of the other big criticisms of Facebook, just to touch back on that, is that it's amplifying hate, that it's amplifying bigotry, that it's amplifying just, you know, extremism. And... From what you're saying, um, there had been an opportunity to, ampli to, to build models that would amplify other citizen oh, voices, and, and that didn't happen because the, the model that Facebook is, because of the targeted advertising model and lots of other reasons, it's, it's designed to amplify it's certain so types of speech, yeah. whereas there, there had been an opportunity to curate and amplify citizen voices representing, you know, other points of view that might not be as viral, but more chance to, amp to lift those up, yep. and that didn't happen. Absolutely. I mean, a, an example, I mean, I, I can't, nobody listens. I mean, my, my blog is not very well read. It used to be, not anymore. Um, and when all this stuff was happening with Facebook, right. it was about a year ago today, a year ago earlier this week, because I know because Facebook shows me the things I wrote a year ago, <laughs> which is actually kind of a nice feature Facebook has. Um, I wrote a very comprehensive piece about what we know about what Facebook does. Nobody read it. I mean, it got no exposure. And yet, how many miles of news articles were written that had no information in it about what Facebook was about? So that's my frustration. You know, it's, I don't have any privilege here. <laughs> Nobody's listening to me. Yeah, you know? that, I mean, but why can't coming. those, I'm a good source when it comes to this stuff. I actually am. I do know. I've actually programmed to their APIs. And that was the issue last year, was tell us about, let us all learn about APIs. It's a great thing that people got curious about it. It's a terrible thing that the news industry didn't rise to the opportunity to actually teach us about APIs. Or notice what was happening quite a long time ago. Well, yeah. Yeah. So, so we're we're getting the the wrap up sing, sing, I'm signal. I'm okay with wrapping and, up. Um, yeah. And and I know that um, we've been I've demanded more time and we've gotten it. So I thank Rosenthal for that. Um, but I, I want to end on one note, which is you told me yesterday what your grandparents warned you about, oh, yeah. and I think this is sort of a reminder why we all have to work together. No kidding. Yeah. So tell us. Well. Um, as I said, you know, my parents were children. Um, they fled the Nazis. It was a complicated situation because my grandmother on my mother's side was a Lutheran. She was a blonde-haired, blue-eyed. She fit in in Nazi Germany, and she married a Jew, my grandfather. My grandfather was deported very early in the process when they were just deporting Jews. They weren't exterminating them. And um, so she had to... Uh, sneak out of the country to get to the United States because they weren't letting Germans leave the country. And uh, uh, on the other side, on my father's side, they left from Romania. And um, my grandfather told me a story about how they were being, sh they were crossing a frozen river and they were being shot at from both sides of the river. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, so they came out really scarred <laughs> from this experience. And, but both of my, especially my paternal grandfather, felt it was very important to pass on to me uh, and my brother um, what he had learned. And he was absolutely sure this was going to happen in the United States. And he told me, this is what you have to watch for. And you know, every one of the things he told me, every one of those things, we've tripped over those wires 
long ago. We're demonizing people based on race. Um, it's not just stopping at race, it's going to religion. It's, I mean, I, it, it, you, you, he was so prophetic. He used words that we made fun of him for, plutocracy, ol oligarchs, all this kind of stuff. Yeah, well, we all use those words now. He told me that when this starts happening, David, you need to get up on the roof with a gun and start shooting them. This is what he said. <laughs> oh my God. And uh, he meant it. So, yeah. The thing is, we have to work together. And so many people are still thinking about their careers and um, how to get ahead and that the world is just somehow going to straighten all this stuff out on its own. And that was another thing he warned me about, is people are going to do that. <laughs> and we have to work together. That's a plea. And it, I don't expect it. Well, I hope it happens. Let's just leave it at that as a final note. Thank you.